In 2013, a guy named Ivan Zhao had a dream. As a university student, he had learned to code in his spare time and realized how big of an advantage it was. He had plenty of friends who made digital art, but since they did not know how to code, they needed help to express themselves on the internet. It was also during the time when it first became possible to create things on the web without needing to code. Seeing all the trends like WordPress blogs and social media, Ivan saw an opportunity. Maybe he could be the first one to enable millions of people to express themselves on the web just as easily as assembling Lego blocks that they could use again and again. It was then that he met another student called Simon Last. They quickly became best buddies and went on to work together, trying to make this dream a reality. In 2013, Zhao and Simon raised about $2 million from angel investors, a mix of friends, family, and friends of friends. Zhao, who had learned to code as a child, had a big vision to enable people to use any computing device with the same creativity and flexibility that they bring to their writing, allowing them to approach devices as a new medium, whatever that might mean someday. Zhao was trying to make good on ideas that he describes as romantic, ones developed by his idols, tech pioneers Alan Kay, Ted Nelson, and Douglas Engelbart. These men saw computers as a way to help humans be more imaginative, more creative, and more capable of leveraging intelligence in ways not yet imagined. In the 1960s and 70s, these men, particularly Engelbart, envisioned a future in which people used computers to design their own software to accomplish whatever they needed. Today, billions of people use computers, yet only 0.34% of the global population are software developers. Almost everyone has to download an app or run a piece of software to accomplish a task. And Zhao compares this to how, prior to the spread of literacy with the invention of the printing press around 1440, only clergy and scribes could read and write, so the rest of the population never composed great works of literature, soul-stirring poetry, or world-changing scientific research. In San Francisco, while Zhao still believed he was right about his grand vision, he realized he was wrong about his market. It was a crucible moment. The first version of Notion was a tool that non-coders could use to make their own apps. Disappointingly for the co-founders, it turned out that even if they were Simon's and Zhao's actual friends, non-coders didn't want app-building software. Zhao explains that their initial product failed to gain traction because it was not easily understood by most people. It was geared more toward the tech-savvy audience. They realized that in order to create a widely used software tool, they needed to start with a product that was already familiar to people and then hide the underlying programming ability. This is similar to how one would sugarcoat broccoli to make it more appealing. After all, very few people wake up wanting to create software. Most people wake up with a desire to browse the internet, write, or solve work-related problems using their computers. Notion, which was initially created to help people use computers for more than just word processing, had to be modified with flexible toolmaking capabilities to better align with this use case. The new version had to be closer to the kind of software that Zhao had envisioned. Over the next two years, Zhao and Simon worked endlessly. They managed to get four more people to help them, and even some startup capital. When Zhao and Simon finally introduced their new Notion to their friends, they experienced a lot of crashes caused by the web component, a Google web framework they had chosen to build with. However, just like most startups at the time, things were not looking great. The software was simply too buggy and unreliable, causing people to lose their content. Almost nobody wanted to use it. The framework was unstable, and bugs were everywhere. As a result, they had to start over using the more stable React libraries, which is now the market leader. Unfortunately, they were running out of investment, and some of their earliest team members had already left. Retaining the remaining team members was becoming more and more difficult by the day. Zhao remembers feeling a sense of despair, which was new for him. Kothari, one of Notion's angel investors, also noted that things didn't look good from the outside. He and Zhao would meet every six months, sharing insights and suggesting potential employees. Kothari felt that investing in Notion was a mistake because the company didn't seem to be going anywhere and was almost out of money. Living and working in San Francisco became too expensive for them as well. Simon had joined Notion while in college, so as the older founder, Zhao was left to decide how to save the business, and a reset was what came to mind. Zhao and Simon had to fire all the employees, start from scratch, and move on to a cheaper area across the globe. Now just the two of them, Zhao and Simon wanted to go somewhere cheaper than San Francisco, and somewhere they'd never visited. They picked Kyoto, Japan, almost on a whim, and subleased their spaces in San Francisco. In 2015, Notion co-founders Simon Last and Ivan Zhao removed from their lives anything that wasn't writing code and eating noodles. Three years into building their startup, they scrapped the code powering their app. 
they were running out of money. They'd just laid off their only colleagues, and to stretch what money they had left, they'd moved from San Francisco to Kyoto, Japan, which was less than half as expensive. Zhao and his roommate rented a tiny two-story house where a simple shoji screen separated their bedrooms. They would spend 18 hours a day at their laptops, without bothering to dress, clean, or even cook. They would just code, code, and code, and only take a break to go out for food. Since neither of them could read or speak Japanese, Zhao, being from China, would read and translate the menu for them, enough for them to figure out what to order. They didn't mind the drudgery or the lack of personal space as they were consumed with reinventing the Notion software. And if they couldn't figure out how to turn it into an everyday tool people would want to run on their computers or smartphones, they would have laid off their friends, burned through millions in angel investment, and wasted years of their lives for nothing. To make things even worse, Zhao had to borrow over $150,000 from his mother just to stay alive. If his family was not that well off, Notion might have just died without any of us knowing about it. Fortunately, Zhao and Simon came up with a very simple design that had a lot of different use cases. You could take notes, check off tasks, and manage different documents necessary for work and personal life. Since they also wanted the app to be as fun to use as Lego, they called each row, each entry within any given document, a block which you can rearrange and edit however you want, something the world had not seen before. The two believed Notion was worth this effort because they were trying to make it into something that would revolutionize people's relationships with computers and software. They wanted to make software that could empower a global community of everyday people to make their own apps and tools without having to write code, all to unlock new levels of creativity and productivity. In March 2016, after spending a year in Kyoto, testing iterations of Notion's functionality and design, Zhao and Simon launched Notion 1.0. During this period, they worked tirelessly on Figma to fine-tune the design and edit the content. The 1.0 version of Notion featured its iconic black-and-white appearance and had the ability to perform word processing, create drag-and-drop to-do lists and wikis, and offer more than 30 document templates, including product roadmaps. Getting that initial launch out the door and into the hands of real users must have been incredibly nerve-wracking for Zhao and Simon. After pouring so much time and energy into the product for over a year, I'm sure many of you aspiring entrepreneurs out there can relate. Let me know in the comments what launching your first product felt like. The highs and lows of that initial feedback are so important. In the meantime, give this video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it so far. With their first version now publicly available, Zhao and Simon aimed to generate awareness and adoption of Notion. Notion 1.0 was marketed as an app that could do everything. They went against the common wisdom in the startup world to only niche down towards one particular type of customer, and instead wanted everyone to use the app, no matter if they were a student, programmer, creative, manager, or executive. The men didn't yet charge to use Notion. They wanted to grow users first, so they used the $150,000 that Zhao's mom loaned him to keep the startup afloat. To get users, Zhao and Simon hatched a plan to get Notion featured on Product Hunt, a site that lets people submit tech products on daily lists for the community to comment on and vote on. The product with the most votes in 24 hours earns additional promotion, as well as international tech community hype. Their plan involved asking the famed entrepreneur and investor Novel Ravikant, who had invested in Notion early, to wake up at midnight when the New Day's list opened and to tweet to his followers to vote for Notion on Product Hunt. The gambit worked. It went better than expected with a few early users who really liked the simple look and friendly experience of the app. Soon, tech insiders, people involved with Y Combinator and other startup incubators were using it. This initial traction allowed Zhao and Simon to expand Notion as a Windows app and an iOS app. However, they could not foresee the insane growth that was going to happen next. A year after the release of 1.0, Zhao and Simon realized that the most beloved feature of their app was the databases. The ability to write down things, categorize them in various ways, and then organize them just like an Excel sheet was groundbreaking. So the team doubled down on it, introducing various ways of looking at the notes, such as a list view, a Kanban board, and various advanced functions for the enthusiasts. Still to this day, no other app has the full database experience that Notion has, and that feature alone is quite synonymous with Notion. At the same time, Notion needed to make money. It could not just totally rely on investors forever, but they still wanted their app to be free for the general public. They instead turned to bigger corporations and startups which at the time were interested in project management tools like Asana, Trello, and Figma. If Notion could become attractive to companies, the problem would be solved. In March 2018, Zhao and Simon released Notion 2.0. Compared to 1.0, they already had a fan base that could spread the message of how good it was. 
the users liked it so much that it gained the number one spot on Product Hunt, and it quickly gained attention. That same year, the Notion community ballooned when David Pierce, then the personal technology columnist at the Wall Street Journal, wrote a glowing review of Notion 2.0. The headline read, The only app you need for work-life productivity. The article called the updated version a rare renaissance app. It became so popular that tons of venture capitalists wanted to be a part of the ride, providing Notion with money just when the founders did not need it. It was at this point that they started charging users monthly subscription fees between $4 and $10 and began turning a profit. Thanks to this newfound fame, in 2019, Notion had officially over 1 million users and several big companies such as Amazon, Pixar, Uber, Toyota, and Nike. And in case you were wondering, Zhao was able to pay his mum back, so all is good there. Zhao was unfazed by this success. He focused instead on evolving the product toward his original vision of empowering people to make their own tools and on growing Notion as a business. The team was only about eight people, but he had just the person in mind to call to help them grow into their next phase. That summer, Kothari, one of Notion's angel investors and current COO at Notion, was working for LinkedIn in India and was visiting San Francisco. He and Zhao met up, just as they always had. This time, Zhao offered him a job, making him the third co-founder. Ivan Zhao may have founded Notion, but the partnership and balance he formed with co-founder Akshay Kothari proved crucial to the startup's success. In 2011, Akshay discovered an early prototype of Notion while looking to invest in startups. He was impressed by Ivan's vision and passion. Akshay ended up making a small angel investment in Notion while it was still a side project for Ivan. Akshay seemed like an ideal partner for the first-time founder Ivan. He brought his own entrepreneurial experience, having previously founded the news aggregation app Pulse, which had been acquired by LinkedIn. Within three years, Kothari had sold Pulse to LinkedIn for $90 million, and Zhao had started Notion. Over the years, Kothari rose through the ranks at LinkedIn, becoming vice president of product and moving to India's tech center, Bengaluru, to help run LinkedIn India as it expanded. So by the time the men met up in 2018, Kothari had built new processes, teams, and cultures inside a company with thousands of employees all over the world. He was who Notion needed. After a few months of convincing his wife that they could reinvent their lives in San Francisco, Kothari joined as chief operating officer. His first job was six months of answering support desk tickets. He talked to thousands of customers and grew to understand the use cases and depth of the product, setting him up, he says, to figure out how to build out the rest of Notion. Zhao sees Simon as his product co-founder and Kothari as his business co-founder. Around this time, Notion was at just under a million users and investors were trying to win the founders over. Notion was profitable, so the founders didn't seek official funding rounds. Instead, the company focused primarily on growing the community. They did this by building relationships with power users. These were the kind of people who took it upon themselves to translate the Notion user guide into Korean because it was only available in English, who ran the Notion subreddit, now with 200,000 subscribers, and who ran the Notion Facebook groups in Korea and the Middle East, both with tens of thousands of members. Zhao saw these people as members of a community, offering them early access to new features, FaceTime with Notion team members, and the opportunity to give input on features. He had a hunch that investing in individual users would ultimately get Notion into big companies. He imagined these people would like Notion so much, they'd keep using it at work. Eventually, this hunch would prove right. For two years, Kothari did all kinds of jobs, built out playbooks, and hired leaders to run the new teams before moving on to the next business need. By the start of the pandemic, Notion had about 40 employees, and they'd raised about $50 million as an insurance policy against pandemic uncertainty. As the world pivoted to remote work, signups grew. After more than a year of pandemic lockdowns, high school and college students started streamlining the overlap of remote school and remote friendship by using Notion to organize their lives, and they were talking about it on TikTok. In viral videos, Gen Z power users would show off the ways they'd customized Notion to help them get more out of their hobbies and collaborate on school projects. Many influencers on YouTube started to grow their followings and advocate for Notion as their number one productivity tool, and thus attracted more and more users to Notion. Right now, Notion is valued at over $10 billion, making it one of the most valuable private SaaS companies in the world. Notion currently has over 30 million users, out of which 4 million are paid users. Notion's growth isn't over yet. Why? Because Notion is still a tool that's still growing, and it doesn't really plan on stopping yet. For a company that started with just 12 employees, there are somewhere between 100 to 350 employees at Notion at the moment. Notion makes around $70 million a year and has a total funding of $350 million.
It's safe to say that this startup journey from scrappy beginnings to a multi-billion dollar business is an aspiring entrepreneur's dream. That's it for today's video. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Your support helps us reach more people with our content. Thanks for watching and consider watching our other videos right here.